to have you here this morning and if you're joining us over Facebook live we're excited that you're here that way too um, be sure to share on Facebook YouTube Twitter all of that so we can get the word out um, Tim is not away this week it said Tim is away this week but he's clearly here Bruh. these are up, not updated all right um, so we're still offering financial peace free to anyone that's interested um, for more information on that please see Quentin or message us on Facebook if you are here with us in person, communion is on the back table still, so go feel free to take it at your own time, as well as um, giving your tithes and offerings in the back. Just whenever you feel free during the service, you can go ahead and partake. Um, also, um, on your bulletin, please leave us a message. There's a little place where you can tear off the card on things um, you would like to see, if you need some information. 
Um, if you want to request a better pastor, I understand that too. You can write that in. Um, just kidding. <laughs> but if you're new to Fall City, please leave us a message on that as well so we can reach out to you um, and get you involved in our church. Um, also, so for our high school students, we're starting something just like after church, just for 15 minutes, there's going to be a little devotional. Um, so if you have a high school level student, um, please feel free to stay for that. Again, just 15 minutes. Um, we would love to do that. And we're still in these troubling times. The world is kind of crazy right now. So please, if there's anything that the church can do for you, please let Tim, Ryan, Quentin come up to find one of us um, and let us know if there's something that we can do for you or someone um, you know, because we don't just want to be a church on Sunday. We want to be a church that is out in the community and really doing what needs to be done. Um, so I think that's it. I think we're going to continue with our set. Let's lift our voice. Let's lift as one. The song I've been singing for a long time. But it talks about unity. It talks about standing up for what we believe. With our arms high, their hearts abandoned. singing to the one true God. Lift him up. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion. My soul now to stand. I used to be for my failure and carry the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. What can I say? What can I say? What can I do? But all find this heart, oh God, completely.
stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all one who gave it all and I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours so I presence in this room right now in this city because he is moving right now even though we may not see him we could feel his presence and see what he's doing in our lives and those around us There's so much hope and joy in the name of Jesus, in the name of his Father God, and in his Holy Spirit.
We come to a time when we remember the sacrifice that was given and we eat the bread that represents his body that was broken and we drink the cup that represents his blood that was poured out. We do this in commemoration of his death, his death that brought us life and life everlasting. Because his death didn't end on the cross because three days later he rose and conquered death and defeated the grave. saved you and I because he wanted us to have a relationship with his father G father God he stole back the keys of hell and death no longer has power over us his grace is sufficient for all of us his grace covers, and his grace was poured out on the cross. His love is unbounding and never failing and never ending, even to the end of the age. He loves us so much, he calls us his sons and daughters. And just ask that we rest in him and find our peace and hope in him. Not in a political figure, not in a, in a boss or a pastor, a husband or a wife. Not in an individual, not in a thing, not in an idol. But find our identity in Christ and our peace and joy in him. So as we partake, let us remember the sacrifice that was given for us by the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The emblems are back on the table. Feel free to social distance and take them at your own time and pace. Feel free to also give up an offering and worship him in that way. God, we just love you so much, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you arrested death and that you conquered it. That death has no sting. It doesn't hurt me anymore. That death has no victory. Because our victory is in you. We love you so much. It's in your precious son, Jesus' name, that we pray. sorrow and dead in my sin a lost without hope and no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began And ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. And my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. And my shame was a ransom. Faithfully bore, and he canceled my debt, and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
And I see you displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoices though heaven and lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in air That's when death was arrested my life That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, and oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's river slow. It is your Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Shout your freedom Oh, we're free, free Forever we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed Yes, we're free Praise his name. Lift him up. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. And I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on. That cursed tree His body bound And drenched in tears They laid him down In Joseph's tomb At the entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still and all alone And oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise His name forevermore For endless days we will sing Your praise Oh, Get on the 
robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and rise and we will rise among the saints our gaze our gaze transfixed on jesus face days we'll lift you up for endless days we'll come before your throne for endless days we'll shout hosanna in the highest as you prepare a place for us let us take advantage of the time that we have here on earth let us make those important connections with those around us with our family with our friends and with our children with our community and with our city. Because it's so evident that you're moving in the city. In a world that's so divisive. In a country right now that's filled with hatred. Let us be peace. Let us be Jesus to our friends. Let us be Jesus to our family. To our brothers and sisters in Christ. And to your children. Thank you so much for the ability we have and the freedoms that we have to worship you. To not have to hide for our beliefs, but to be able to come out and standly bold before you and proclaim you as Father. I just pray that we take that boldness to the world and that we tell others about you and about what you've done for us. Because each of us have a story of where Jesus met us. And if you don't yet, you will, because he's waiting with his arms wide for those that hear his voice and listen to him. Maybe it's time you take that time to rest in his peace. Thank you so much for the way you love us, for your son, Jesus. Please be with Tim as he brings your message. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. 
I mean, some of you already sat down because you're lazy, but you have my permission now. Um, I want to welcome you guys uh, to Fall City Christian Church. We are happy that you're here. Um, the wonderful Elizabeth G., uh, as mouthy as she is from the stage, she did a great job doing the announcements, but she missed one because she's a jerk. Um, we're doing Jonah's Jammies. There's a box right outside the door. Last year, I can't remember how much they, it was thousands, right? Thousands of jammies. I, I, if not millions. But I, I don't know that I've ever said the words together, thousands of jammies in my life. So I at least get that. But anyways, we're, we're uh, collecting um, PJs, I believe socks, and maybe blankets uh, for uh, kids who are in the hospital right now. Uh, we have a, a young man named, named Jonah Bump uh, who had what I, I don't know the technical name for it. I call it Bubble Boy Disease. You guys ever watch that movie, Bubble Boy? It's, it's basically that, but serious. And um, he went through a he went through a like a stem a transplant of some sort, and he's 100% healed. Like that's like a, a living, walking miracle in our church. And so they spent months in a Children's Hospital in Louisville, and uh, one of their ministries now is to collect uh, PJs and blankets and socks for the kids that, and families that are stuck there uh, for months in some cases, years. So we want to get behind that. Yep. Zero all the way to extra large. And I'll, yeah, I'll take a pair with the feet in them <laughs> and a hood and maybe some teddy bear ears. I think that's, yep, yep, absolutely. So if you guys are out and about, if you're doing your click list, just throw some jammies on there. Those people open up your trunk and throw them in there for you anyway. So um, uh, last year we were able to be a part of that. This year I know that we're, we're going to. And the great thing about uh, the church and church people is that we tend to up the ante each year. So maybe it is millions this year. Right, Ryan? <laughs> so we're in, a, we're in the, last, um, the last episode, last message. We'll call it episode um, of, of a, a series called The Masquerade. And uh, like I've said, every Sunday I found this series appropriate considering, number one, our girl Rona. Um, and we have to wear those, those masks. Um, and then we walk somewhere and then we realize that we forgot our mask in the car. So we cuss under our breath all the way to the car till we get our mask on. Then we can cuss like for real because people can't see our mouths moving. But, um, and also the fact that it's October. And October is kind of that month for masks. We've got some people that, that have even gone to haunted houses. Uh, the scariest thing about haunted houses is the fact that most of those are drunk frat guys, right? And they smell like dip spit. And they get up in your, fi- your face and they growl at you and it smells terrible. Um, but anyways, honestly, uh, there are things in our lives that we hide behind. And I call those masks. We hide behind these. We try to act tough when we're hurt or when we're sad. We try to put on a tough face when we're afraid or when we're, uh, when we're scared. A scared. Man, I haven't said that since I was like four. Um, we pretend uh, like things are okay when things are not. And most people can tell, but there's this, there's this mask that society has put on us that, hey, just don't ask, right? Don't dig into it, Right? And so we have, we've kind of programmed ourselves to, to push down and pin up uh, our real feelings. And why? Because people don't want to be around people that have problems. But if we're being honest, good luck finding somebody who don't have problems. Then people don't want to be around people, right? And so if we could just kind of adopt this mindset of being real, that's something we don't have to worry about. And, and besides, at what cost? What does what 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 it does in the long run? What does it do to what does it do for us to keep pushing down these feelings and pinning up these feelings and not being able to be authentic and real? Like, what does that do for us? It kind of makes us mean and hateful over the years, right? We wear these masks for so long, and eventually, we don't even know who we are anymore. We're not sure how we're supposed to act, what we're supposed to do, what we're supposed to wear, how we're supposed to talk, who we're supposed to talk to. We've allowed expectations and the pressure of society 
to then turn us into something that we're not. To turn us into something that, that we don't even recognize. And then we sit and we look in the mirror and we wonder why we don't have any real friends. Right? What? Well, that could be because rarely do we find real people. And if we can't find real people, then we can't have real friends. And if you can't be a real person, then you can't be a real friend. If you can't be a real friend, then you probably don't have any friends. Right? If you cannot be a real friend, then don't plan on having any real friends. Right? And so we mask this. And we refuse to do the hard stuff. But the thing about it is, is hard stuff is hard stuff. You can, either, you can either try hard at fixing a relationship or you can deal with how hard it is to abandon a relationship. Right? Either way, it's freaking hard. So we come upon uh, this guy in the book of Acts. He's been shaped by religion. He's been shaped by the culture that he was born into. And he is the cream of the crop when it comes to potential leadership. And he's also the cream of the crop when it comes to enforcing rules. His name is Saul. Now, he's coming up uh, through the ranks as a, as a Pharisee. He's graduated uh, from the guy who once held the coats of the men who kill Christians to the, to the guy who chases Christians down and kills them and imprisons them. And then this happens in Acts. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering uh, threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and, and, the, and the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him uh, by the hand, this big, strong man who was climbing through the ranks, now his companions lead him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there uh, blind for three days, and he didn't eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias, yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to uh, Straight Street, uh, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's He's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. I know that's a, a long story, and we're going to dive into that. We're going to unpack it a little bit. But long story short, he is on his way to Damascus to hunt um, some of these Jesus-loving hippies, okay? That's what he's doing. Like, he's going to kill him some hippies. Uh, but, but he's stopped dead in his tracks by this, this supernatural moment. Jesus essentially says to him, all right, you were built for something more to this. I know that you've been, you've been doing this all your life. I know that this is the ladder that you've been climbing, but you've been built for something more than this. And this, this mask of religion, well, it's been the obstacle for you to get to me. So here I am. I came to you. To take off uh, the mask that has been uh, keeping you from seeing who I am and 
who you really are. Right? To take that mask off. So he can see who Jesus is and who he really is in Jesus. Now, now you're going to see who you are, but only after you realize the effects of not being able to see at all. So he sends him to Ananias to heal him. Ananias has a problem. That problem is fear. We've talked about that quite a bit over the past few weeks. And God says, don't be afraid. Saul's about to know who he is. And what he is, well, he's my chosen instrument to the Gentiles. So Paul's road to Damascus was actually his road to Damask him, to Damask him, right? Which is, I think, what we all hope for is to be, is our road to Damascus, right? Anyways, but what happens? What if, what if we ignore that moment, that supernatural moment in our lives, that moment to Damask us? To pull, this, to pull this veneer off of us that everybody sees but isn't the real us. What happens if we refuse to become the person that God intended us to be? Because we're afraid of what people think. Because the easiest way, the quickest way, the fastest way to forget what God thinks about you is to worry about what everybody else thinks about you. And so here are some thoughts. Here are some thoughts on refusing to step into that supernatural moment. The first thing that we do if we refuse to take that mask off is we remain blind. We remain blind. We just, we just turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world and, and we fit into this, this compartment, this, this machine, this culture that we were never meant to fit into. So, so if Paul had decided that he didn't, th- didn't care that he was blind, and he was going to keep doing what, what it is that made him famous, which was being a really good Pharisee, I believe that he would have had to do that blind for the rest of his life. I don't believe that God would have given him, would have restored his eyesight if he's like, nah, I'm good. I don't believe that. He would have remained blind, uh, not only physically, but to, to who Jesus is. He would have remained blind to who he was supposed to be. And on top of that, he would have never, ever been picked for a game of Pictionary again in his life because he was blind, right? But Jesus, but Jesus steps in because that's what Jesus does. That's the entire gospel story, y'all. We could not beat sin and hell and death. And what happens? Jesus steps in. Because that's what he does. He gives us an opportunity to do something about, um, about our run-ins with blindness and inauthenticity. And either we do what we need to do, either we're obedient, or we remain blind, right? Check this story out. Super gross story. Anyways, it says, as Jesus was walking along, Uh, He saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, uh, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin or his parents' sin? It was not because of his his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be uh, seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one sent to us. Is my mic dead? My mic sounds dead. Okay. Is my mic dead? You can hear me. Is my mic dead? Okay. Sorry. Oh. That's time to fall asleep, right? Anyways, uh, the, ni- the night, he says, the night is coming, um, and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then, now this is the gross part. I want you to, I want you to check this out because this is freaking gross, y'all. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva, and spread the mud over the, bl- the blind man's eyes, and then told him, go wash yourself in the pool of uh, Siloam. Siloam means scent. 
So the man went and uh, washed, and he came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him uh, as the blind beggar asked each other, Is, isn't this the man who uh, used to sit and beg? Some said uh, he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, I'm that dude. That's a paraphrase, by the way. Um, they asked, uh, who healed you? What, what happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went, and I washed myself, and now I can see. Well, where, where is he now? They asked. I, I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. Uh, the Pharisees asked the man all about it, and so he told them, he put mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. That's all I know, right? All I know is I met Jesus, and he fixed it. All I know is Jesus stepped in, and now I can see. So there are a couple things about our road that we can learn from this story, okay? First, there are amazing moments in our lives. There are amazing moments in our life that, that can be used to show the power of God. It can come from our weaknesses. It can come from our victories. Second, sometimes we don't understand what's going on, and that's okay. Or even like uh, we don't understand the methods by which he's going to show his power, i.e. making mud from saliva and wiping it on a dude's face, right? Right? I don't understand that. He understands it, right? That's kind of gross. Thirdly, though, there's always an element, and I want you to listen to this. There's always an element of obedience that has to take place. There's always this element of obedience. Jesus said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash your face. He was specific on where to go and what to do. There was a purpose to it, right? And in order to receive his sight, he had to do it the way that Jesus instructed. Go to the pool of Siloam. Don't go uh, to the nearest body of water. Don't go over to this pot full of water over here. Don't go anywhere else. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash your face. Can you imagine being blind for your entire life and all of a sudden getting to see? This is a, a whole new sense that you get to experience, one that you have not been able to have because you're obedient. Because you do what you were told to do as you were told to do it. Like him and Saul, if we, do, if we don't allow ourselves to go where he instructs us to go, we'll remain blind to what he has in store for us. Some of us, some of us, we've got blinders on and we're going where we want to go, but that's not necessarily where God intends for us to go. And we get frustrated and wondering why it's not working out, but we've not been obedient. The second thing is, if we don't take this mask off, if we don't take advantage of this road to Damascus, we rob others of the good news. We rob others of a really good story, don't we? We rob others of a redemption story. I love this part of the story because ultimately Saul becomes Paul, and Paul... Like Saul was a bad guy, but Paul, he wrote the majority of the New Testament. He traveled most of the known world telling people about Jesus. He literally baptized entire towns of people. That doesn't happen if Saul doesn't become Paul. That doesn't happen if he's not obedient to Jesus, right? There are entire nations of people that would not have heard the good news if Saul was not obedient. He even had moments where he kept uh, the OG disciples in check. For those of you who don't know OG, it's original gangsta, okay? Um, because they were, they were robbing people of the good news. Listen to this in Galatians. It says, but when, when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. Like, like that's, big, that's gangster talk right there. I mean, it's a bit proper. But I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. 
that's kind of gangster too. Uh, but afterward, uh, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you not trying to make these Gentiles follow, or why, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right. I need you to listen to me. Yet we, know, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus, not by obeying the law. And we've believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we've obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God just by obeying the law simply by obeying the law. It's deeper than that, y'all. There's layers to this. Playa Teramasu. It's a quote from the great theologian Macklemore. Anyways, um, so Peter, uh, Peter was cool for a bit, all right? But when a certain group of, of prominent Christians show up, he masks up, doesn't he? He masked up. He's like, no, 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 no. I back up. I'm throwing this mask on. And the thing about it is these guys were friends of James. Do you know who James was? He was the brother of Christ. So he was kind of a big deal. Like he, he he had power here, right? James was a big deal because he was the brother of Christ. So Peter didn't want to be criticized by them. So he throws on his mask of superiority in order to schmooze with these guys. This is what he does. And Paul the one who knew this kind of life and this kind of behavior, Paul calls Peter out. He calls him out. And this also was a big deal. I mean, this is Peter we're talking about, right? The, um, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, that guy. The one that was the first person to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, right? Right? And Paul, well, he met Jesus after this whole death, burial, and resurrection thing. So some people didn't even think it was legit, right? And so it's new blood calling out the OG. But Paul knew that there was no room for inauthenticity when it comes to the salvation and the sanctification of people. Imagine being led to Christ and they're being treated, treated like a second-class citizen in church. Doesn't that kind of seem off? Doesn't that kind of seem wrong and, and, and weird? Doesn't that, doesn't that make the good news a little less good newsy? Doesn't it? So, so there is something inside of you that allows you to stick up for others in a way that no one else can, but we mask it, right? Just like Peter did. Peter masked it up. Whenever it was, whenever it was his opportunity to stick up for the Gentiles, he threw on the mask. Why? So he doesn't have to deal with the criticism. The same way. We don't want to stir up trouble, right? So we mask it. And the third thing, whenever we refuse to take off the mask, when we refuse to take advantage of this road to demask us, we walk away sad. We walk away sad. Now, now Paul had a pretty plush life as a, as a Pharisee, all right? But there comes a time when we, we question that. There, there's, there's like a, a point in time where, where we wonder, what, what am I working so hard for? Who am I working so hard for? There's, there's got to be something greater than just the surface stuff, the steady paycheck and the 401K, the three-bedroom, the three two-bath house and the 2.5 kids, the golden doodle and the cat that is sometimes sweet and sometimes, sometimes a jerk, kind of like a Sour Patch kid or like my real kids. Um, 
like seriously though, there's a there's a point where I'm sure that Saul would have been traveling and saying, I'm taking a lot away from this world, but what am I actually giving to it? I'm taking a lot from this world, but what am I actually contributing to it? A point where another rule breaker Christian is dead won't fulfill him. Like he's had enough of that. Another notch in the belt doesn't fix it for him. A point where elaborate dinners are so commonplace that it becomes tedious to go to them. A point where he needs to know if there is something greater that he was hardwired for. And listen, without Jesus, that question cannot be answered. Without the answer, you will be unfulfilled at the end of your life. And the answer is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. I've not heard anybody on their deathbed say, "Mm, I wish I would have worked longer hours. I wish I would have thrown a few more thousand into the 401k. I wish... I had a, a, a bigger house. That would have been nice if I just had a bigger house. And if you got kids, that's more rooms where the lights are on when nobody's in the room. You have to walk around and turn the lights off, right? I've never heard somebody on their, their deathbed that, that said, I, I, I wish I would have bought that car. Or I should have traded my wife in on 220s when she turned 40, right? Never heard anybody on their deathbed say that. Um, but no, it's, it's typical. Like, what you hear on the deathbed is normally fear or regret, right? Or trust in who Jesus is. The ones who were able to be real and have great relationships, they hate leaving their loved ones, right? But how many funerals have you been to when you've heard about the drama and people fighting over their stuff? If they knew Jesus, they were good, though. Check out this story. It's the last story I got to tell. Um, Once a religious leader asked Jesus uh, this question. Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. Because he knew what he was getting at, right? He was going to talk about how good he was. But to answer your question, you know... um, You know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your mother and father. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Scout's honor. Like I'm an upstanding citizen, right? And when Jesus heard his answer, he said, "Hmm, there's still one thing. Still one thing you haven't done. Sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. Next. There we go. For he was very rich. She fell asleep on me, I think. <laughs> She's going to blame the computer, but I heard her snoring. But anyways, so, but, but I want you to, I want you to listen. I want you to stop. I want you to stop. And, and think about this. Jesus gave him this moment, right? Similar to Saul's moment on the road to Damascus, Jesus gave him this moment. He says, this is who I am. This is who you are. This is what you need to do, right? He, he gifted him that moment. And this guy, he had his crap together. He was rich and he stayed out of trouble. Like he was living the American dream, right? Right? And Jesus didn't refute that he was good at following rules. Like, that wasn't an argument. But he said, there's more. There's more than what you're living. There's more than what you're doing. There's more than what you look like. But you're hiding behind your stuff. You're hiding behind your riches. Your wealth is your mask. Your behavior is your mask, right? For us, it's you're hiding behind your job. You're hiding behind your title. You're hiding behind your GPA 
or, or, or your pay stub or your car or your, your manliness, which I think nowadays is your beard. I wish I could grow a good beard. Hide behind that sucker. Anyways, you're hiding behind your political affiliation. You're hiding behind your mindset or your toughness or your toys or your possessions or your intellect. Or some of you, you're hiding behind your stupidity, which is stupid, right? <laughs> but you're, but there's, there's something about you that you allow to define you. There's something about you that you are hiding behind. Just like this man was, was hiding behind his behavior and his ability to follow rules, and he was hiding behind his wealth. That's what this guy did. He walked away sad. Why? Because he didn't want to take his mask off. He was comfortable. He felt secure hiding behind what it is he was hiding behind. So he walks away sad because he had always been defined by his stuff and his behavior. And Jesus is saying, you're hiding behind your stuff. Unload it and follow me. That is your next step. That's your next step. That's your moment on your road to be demasked, right? And let me tell you something. It is hard to be authentic in a world where inauthentic people want to take cheap shots behind, from behind a keyboard. It's hard. It's hard to be authentic in a world that is so fake, and surface-oriented, right? But if we can get comfortable with the uncomfortable, if we can get comfortable with being real with ourselves and with one another, if, if we can become who God hardwired us to be, then, then we'll be able to spread the good news, We'll be able to be a part of those moments and a part of the lives of people who get to see for the first time in their lives. Get to see who God is. Get to see who they are. Right? And then we get to be a part of being that vessel of hope for people that brings about joy in the world as opposed to fear and contention and polarity. Right? If we can be those people, if we can get comfortable being that person. And it's, it's hard, and it hurts for a little bit, but you've got to be able to deal with that if you want to get on the other side of things and be who it is that you're supposed to be because what it is you're chasing right now, if it is not Jesus, then it's not going to fill the void. If it is not Jesus, then it is not going to work. And if you want to continue to put that mask up and chase that, then you will remain blind. You'll, you will be that person that withholds the good news. And you will walk away sad. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for um, these supernatural moments that you give us to cut everything away and to be who it is you created us to be. I pray that we can get comfortable in that. Father, I pray that, that today can be this moment for some people and for myself in a lot of ways. Lord, I pray that, that we as a church can create an environment where people are comfortable walking in, taking off their masks and be who they're supposed to be. And as they grow more and more comfortable with that, more and more used to that, then they can do that out there too and make a real impact. We love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died, who was buried, who resurrected, who beat sin and hell and death so that we can be reconciled back to you, our Father. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So I got a, a, a moment. Uh, if you guys can stick around for just another minute, I'm going to have Ryan come up. He's got an announcement to make. He wants to talk to you about a couple things. Uh, we love him. We appreciate him. And, yeah. <laughs> Jerk.
a short cord. So uh, I love you guys. Um, all you guys know that. I don't know if a lot of you guys know my backstory, but I've been leading worship in some capacity for like 15 years. It's like um, I started as uh, playing in a heavy metal band, <laughs> and uh, my hair's changed a lot of different ways. It's gone up. It's gone down. Um, but somebody a long time ago said when I was in church, he said, I heard that you play the guitar. And um, from that moment on, I was probably like 23 or so. From that moment on, like God kind of changed the course of like my life. And um, I was always a Christ follower, but I, always, I wasn't always living the right way. But he took just one little thing and um, changed the course of my life from there on. And leading worship has been... I've never been the greatest singer. I've never been the greatest musician. Um, God's always seemed to put like amazing, amazing musicians around us, and to be able to do what we've what we've done at different places and here at Fall City um, has been truly amazing. I mean, with Tim, I met Tim a long time ago. We were playing at a at a prison ministry. I mean, we I've played in a pr prisons, halls, churches for thousands and for two. And it's never been about um, anything but glorifying God. And um, just always been really blessed with, um, with um, just everything. He's, God's always kind of led me, even though I've struggled um, throughout my life, and constantly say, God, why do, why do you use me? Why do you bless me? Um, I know that he's given me a gift to communicate and uh, to reach other people. Um, God's also gifted me with an awesome family, um, not just an amazing church family, but um, when I started worshiping, I was, I was young, and, or leading worship, I was young, didn't have a family. I lived in Madison, and you guys may or may not know, but I live in Jeffersonville now, which is about an hour away, and um, commute here. I've been doing commuting back and forth for almost probably seven years now, and um, it's tough. It's tough, especially when you add um, the dynamic of having a wife and two small children. And um, just over the, when, when we started this church, we were, we were all trying to, you know, working through a lot of emotions. And um, I've never really had a time where I was able to rest. Never really had a time where I was able to, like, um, worship with my family. Um, and... I met with Tim a few weeks ago and told him kind of what I've been going through, and this has been going on for a while, um, and spoke with Adam, too, and, and Quentin, and um, next week's going to be my last week leading for a while. Um, I need to just kind of step back and kind of focus on my family. I've got a, a child. Uh, I've got two children, one that's four and one that's two. I mean, I was up like four times last night. <laughs> Um, it's just like the season of life I'm in right now. Um, I feel like God is calling me to lead um, not that I have any less passion for leading worship, um, but I feel like he's calling me to lead them right now. When I grew up, my mom, uh, my, my family, my brother, my sister, we always went to church with my mom, and my dad was a different denomination, and we would go multiple times to different places, and we're always stretched. And the one thing that I always wanted was my dad to be there worshiping with us. And... I don't want my kids to not have that because I don't know that I've ever truly been able to worship with my family. I know it's, I don't know if it's selfish. I've never tried to be selfish with anything that I've done. If anybody knows me, ask any of the musicians here, like I'm a super planner, like everything. It's just like as soon as Sunday's over, you know, a lot of times um, I'll have music set up, lined out. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. And um, I don't know. It's just, it's just a thing where, um, I don't think it's, I don't know, I told Tim it might be next week I'm, I'm back, you know, because I'm like, that's what am I doing? Um, but I really feel like there's a time just logistically with the, with the traveling, with the planning, with I, I work 50 hours a week in my job, um, raising two kids, and my wife has medical issues and puts a lot of strain on our family dynamic right now. And it's nothing against, like, the church. We love Fall City. We love what it was founded upon. Um, and we're still going to be here. You'll see us, you know, from time to time. It just may, may not be as much as it is now. And there'll be times when maybe they'll call me back to lead here and there. 
Um, and I know we have like amazing musicians here that are gonna step up and help out um, too in that fashion. I tried to give them a little notice um, just so that they kind of knew where I was at. And like I say, I'm still working through it and um, I've been blessed to be a part of the leadership team here and to get to know every single one of you, I feel like um, we are a family. And um, the one thing, one thing I told Tim is that, like, I mean, my friends are here. And being, even though it's only an hour away, being uprooted does, it, it puts a strain on a lot of things. And um, I don't want to lose my friendships with the people that I love. And I don't want this to be something that's... Um, that's a sad thing. It's, I mean, I feel like God moves people at different times for different reasons. He moved us here. He's moved me so many times in my life that, um, I don't know, it's, it's just been a blessing to see what, what he's done and what he's doing. Um, we're going to continue to support the church uh, with our tithes and offerings. We still believe in what the church is doing here, and um, we, we want to support that and support, you know, whoever, you know, replaces or takes my place or leads in my stead for a while. I, I, like I say, I'm still working through it. And, um, but I want you guys to know and, that I'll be praying for every single one for Tim, who is my, my brother from another mother. I mean, he married me. We, I watched my, my wedding video the other day and just like, we were all super thin and look really good. Um, but it's just like, um, to have a bond like I have with Adam and Tim and, um, my uncle Reggie, who I've gained uh, just a love through just the worship ministry um, that I've never I never had before, and you know Mark and Britton and all these people that have come alongside of me um, for one goal, and you all too. I mean, we've all been this together. It's never been about me. It's never been about anything else. But it's just a time when I need to like probably for the first time in my adult life where. Um, I have to kind of put my family first because I feel like it's where God is like leading me. And I hope you can understand. I hope you're not like upset with me if you are. Um, Mike, don't punch me in the face. You already got in a fight recently. Um, but like I really love everybody here. And um, I don't want to let, it's never my intention to let anybody down. I'm not giving up on the church. I still believe and everything that, that the church is doing. And I know, I mean, just over the, the past month in a pandemic, we're, you know, we're packing this place out and it's not because of me. It's because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in each one of us and what he's doing through Tim and his gift to, to lead. And even from a long time ago when we were leading a campus crusade for Christ and, and I'm Tim's like preaching for these like college kids and, hearing him preach and the passion that he's had for, like, I knew at some point, I'm like, Tim, you got it. I mean, it's like, <laughs> um, I've seen it from a long time ago, and he's always seen something in me, and um, I really appreciate that. Um, but thank you guys so much for everything that you've poured into me, and um, I'm exhausted right now. Uh, it's just like, life is, life is hard. I know we all go through it, and physically, and mentally, and emotionally, it's just like, week in and week out. Um, I, like I say, I don't know what it's like not to just to like take it easy. <laughs> Even I have vacations or whatever, you know, here and there. But still, I'm like from Disney World planning worship sets and stuff. Um, not that I've ever, uh, you know, not enjoyed that. But um, I don't want to put a strain on anybody. And I love you all and hope you can understand. Um, hope you guys will come back next week. And um, we're going to have a, a big band up here, probably everybody I've ever played with. We'll be up here, um, and like I say, it's not it's not a goodbye forever. It's just like for for at least the season, I got to figure it out. I've got to like follow what God's calling me to do. So I hope that you guys can understand that and respect that, and uh, not hate me, um, <laughs> um, and just just kind of get that. Anybody that has that has had young kids and that has had um, like that dynamic, they I think they can understand a little better, um, and. Put, put on top of that, you know, my, my normal job and um, the, the, the medical issues that my wife has, it's, it's really difficult to balance all that. And I've been able to for a long time, but it's been, um, I don't want to put a strain on uh, my family anymore. And uh, I don't want to put a strain on my church family either because I love all you guys. And all my family still comes here, so this is still my church. And uh, I hope you guys can understand that. And I don't know about
what I got, Tim. So. so. Have a good week. All right. Have a good week. <laughs> yeah. I'll be happy to talk to anybody about, about anything. I love you guys.